If you'll please take the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Psalms. We're going to go to Psalm 51. If you'll please stand. Psalm 51. Just want to draw your attention to verse 13. We'll read verse 13 tonight of Psalm 51. The Bible says in Psalm 51, verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Now this is David. He's, he's talking to the Lord um, here about teaching transgressors, and he's teaching them the Lord's ways and how sinners will be converted unto the Lord. And we continue talking about Psalm 51. And we've titled the series of messages, David's Recipe for Revival Included Repentance. Uh, this is the third message in, in, uh, the, in Psalm 51. Thinking about repentance. Thinking about repentance. We, when we look at this psalm, we see his repentance throughout the psalm, but we see what led to it at the, in the title of it. And how we got to verse 13 is, it comes to the title here. The title says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when, the Na when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. And we had said that really it's, it's backwards. It's written backwards of how it happened um, here. But it says it's to the chief uh, musician. It was written so that they could be sung, so all that would know about it and hear about it. And, of course, David was used to write it. And uh, it was uh, after the fact that, that uh, Nathan had came to him and rebuked him and said, Thou art the man. Um, and the Lord got his attention with that. And then through getting his attention uh, because of the sin with Bathsheba and multiple other sins that come out of that, he come brokenhearted to the Lord in Psalm 51. And the Lord has recorded this for us, his broken heart and his repentance here toward the Lord. Let's go to the Lord and ask His help tonight as we look at His Word. Father, it is good to be able to call you Father tonight, to know that when we call on you, that you are waiting to hear from us, that we have the entrance in through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, that we should come humbly because it is nothing of us, all of you. And we should come boldly because of the entrance you give us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We can come boldly and find help in the time of need. And so tonight, we are needy people. We need to hear from you in our own hearts. We need to hear from you through your word. Would you place some things upon our heart? Would you burn it into our souls tonight? some things that we need. Would you speak to us? Would you speak to us in a still small voice? But it be as loud as anything that you're directing and guiding us. Lord, you know the needs we have as your church family at this time, not being able to come together as you've designed it and we desire for it to be. But even in our separate places, would you bind our hearts together tonight by your Holy Spirit and may we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we get the truth from your word tonight and may you guide us through it. May you deal with the one maybe that's lost tonight and doesn't realize that they, that they need to place their faith in your son Jesus Christ for salvation. May they come to you. Lord, for us as your children, may you, may you guide us ever so gently, but ever so specifically, even into repentance. I think we have a lot of repentance to do in our life. Of acknowledging your ways and what you want for us. And so we ask you to do this in our lives and our hearts tonight, Lord. And we'll thank you for what you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So what we have already looked at is broken up the previous 12 verses here in Psalm 51 into two sections. We were talking about David's recipe for revival included repentance. Well, first we saw that he became sorry for his sins. In verse 1 through 9, we talked about 
how he became sorry for his sins, how we, how we see his, his conviction, he became aware of his sins, and then we see his confession, how he acknowledged and changed his attitude about his sins, and then we see his cleansing, he wanted his sins abolished, he told the Lord. So he became sorry for his sins, and then in verse 10, 11, and 12, we looked at and said that he became sick of himself, not only for the sins that he was committing, but sick of himself that within himself, these things were taking place, and, and uh, that's where it all starts anyway, on the inside, and works its way out, whether it be righteousness or whether it be sin um, in our flesh. And so we saw that he was sick of being dirty in verse 10, and he was sick of being fearful in verse 11, and he was sick of being weak in verse 12. So he was sorry for his sins, and he was sick of himself. And that brings us to verse 13 tonight, and another section that I'm calling... He became surrendered to serve. Now this takes place in verse 13, 14, and 15, but I didn't want to cram too much in tonight in the message, and so I thought we're just going to cover verse 13 tonight and look at two things that he was surrendered to serve in or surrendered to do in his life. Verse number 13, so with the mindset of him being sorry for his sins and being sick of himself, we come to verse 13 and we see this at the very beginning. Then, then, the word then. He's talking about when all the things that he's already poured out to the Lord and all the things he's already asked for leading up to verse 13, when that happens, then something is going to take place in David's life. And first of all, we see he was surrendered to teach transgressors. So the Bible says here, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. So David anticipated that the Lord would change him. Not only would he change the fact that of him committing sins, and not only would he change his heart, that he wouldn't be sick of who he was inside and what he was holding inside in his heart, and no one else knew about it. And again, we don't know how long, maybe years he held this in. Maybe a couple of years or, or so. Maybe it was a few weeks. Maybe it was, I don't know the time period but he held it in. But he said, when these things, when the Lord answered his prayer, when the, when the Lord uh, did what he said here in the previous verses, when he created it with him a clean heart and renewed a right spirit within him, when, uh, when he gave him the power of his Holy Spirit again, when he re restored the joy of his salvation to him, all these things, he said, then will I teach transgressors thy way. So he anticipated there was going to be some changes in his own life. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to teach transgressors thy way. So he was surrendered. He said, I'm calling out on you, and I know when you turn my heart, when things get right, when I get clean, when everything takes place, then this is what's going to happen in my life because there's going to be change. And by the way, when the Lord works, there's always change in a person's life. Uh, the Bible says we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. He makes the change. He actually transforms us into something that we were not. And that's what I believe David's even crying out here for. He didn't understand the New Testament language of being transformed, but he did know and had a relationship with the Lord and knew what the Lord could do in a person's life. And so as he's calling out here, first he says, then will I. He knows that true repentance will not only change his mind, but it's going to change his actions. He was saying, then will I. I'm going to do something. Once this happens, I'm going to be doing something. Now, I want you to understand this. Repentance is not in word only. Not in word only. I think we have a lot of repentance in word only. I think I've seen that in my life, but I, but I think as a whole, as Christians, we experience repentance just with our mouths. Or we say, yes, I'm not going to do this anymore, or I don't want to do that anymore. We say it in our mouth, but it's not in our hearts. And it's only in word only. So, I want you to go to Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. As I make this statement that repentance is not in word only, we see that here in Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. The Bible says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles. Now this is what the part, he's showing all these people and talking to them. He says that they should repent and turn to God. Okay, they should repent and turn to God. 
But it's not in word only. Because the Bible goes on and says, And do works meet for repentance. What, what he's saying is, is that when we say something with our mouth and repent, then our works should match that repentance. It's not really biblical repentance if your works do not follow the repentance. I mean, we can say all we want, I hate this sin and I don't ever want to do it again, but if it doesn't change, then there's no true repentance in that. That's a, that's a non-biblical, I would say weak, but it's non-biblical repentance. It's a mouth, word only repentance. A person's works does not save him, but they do show if a person has faith and repentance, if there are works. Now, let's look at some Bible verses here. Um, and I think this is, this is one reason why, and I talk about it a lot, and, I, and I, I tell people that you don't get saved by works, but I can see where those people who come to that conclusion in the Word of God, and they say, well, you've got to have works to get to heaven. I can see where they come to the conclusion because the emphasis upon works is there. But it's because there's biblical repentance and there's biblical confession and there's biblical salvation because biblical faith is being used. And when those things are in motion, then there are biblical works. But works never come first. They always come second to a, a heart work that's being done. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll go with me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of works, I'm saying not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So that's pretty clear, and, and this is what I'll tell you. When you're studying the Bible, you always go from what's clear to what's not clear. And this is a very clear passage of Scripture, and it says it is not of works. We're not saved by works, and this is talking about the salvation of soul, of a man's soul, and it's by grace are you saved through faith. That's how you're saved. It's very clear. Now... Now it's going to talk about works in verse 10. Now that a person has been saved by grace through faith, not of their works, now the Bible says in verse 10, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. So once we got into Christ, all this centers around being in Christ by faith, by His wonderful grace that He's extended to us, not of our works. He, we now become His workmanship. He is working in us. We are created in Christ Jesus. And what, is, and what are we created in Christ Jesus for? The Bible says, Good unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. What does that mean? That means that before Paul got saved, or before any of these Ephesians got saved, or anybody else that would hear this letter got saved, and they became real believers by faith through God's grace, he already set it up that when any man get in, was to get into Christ by faith, that they would have works because he would produce that in them. And they would now desire something they never desired before because they were spiritually dead and now they're spiritually alive. So the Bible shows us that here. So true biblical faith and repentance really does bring true works, but never the other way around. True, true working and works will never bring salvation. It's not that way. So let's go to Acts chapter 20. Go with me to Acts chapter 20 here. And verse number 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have shown you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Listen to what he says. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he preached. He didn't preach baptism. He didn't preach works. But this true repentance toward God, a changing of mind and a coming into agreement with God about something and having faith in Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross, that's where salvation was. That's what he was preaching uh, to the Jews and to the Greeks as he went publicly and house to house talking to them. Then we get to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 and verse 6, the Bible says, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So there's a, 
a line drawn in the stand, and on one side of that line is grace, and on the other side of that line is works. And Paul, um, Paul's saying here, as he writes to the Romans, he's saying, if it is by grace, then it cannot be by works. And if it's by works, then it cannot be by God's grace, giving us something we don't deserve, because we're earning it if it's by works. And it's not grace. It's like you're trying to take oil and mixing it with water. It doesn't work. They always separate. And it's the same thing here. So I'm talking about works, and we ought to have biblical works, and it ought to come out of biblical repentance. And David is having biblical repentance here because his life is going to be changed, and his works are going to be changed. Look at Titus. Look at Titus with me. Titus chapter 3. Let's begin reading in verse number 3 of Titus chapter 3. And the Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes... Now, he's, this is past tense. This is before he come to know Jesus as his Savior and before they come to know Jesus as their Savior. He's making a statement about that. And he says, We were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Then he makes a statement. But after that the kindness... And love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. He said, this is that salvation. He's about to explain salvation here. And he said, after that, meaning they didn't do those things anymore. They, their life changed because there was repentance involved in salvation, which repentance is not a work. It's part of confessing. It's part of coming into agreement with God by faith and trusting Jesus as your Savior. And he says this, this whole, the whole idea of the kindness and love of God appearing to man, it says that didn't happen in verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us. Again, very clear, it's not our works. It's nothing we've done, but it's His mercy that He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's something He did in us with the Holy Ghost come to indwell in us. The Bible says in verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So you didn't have any renewing of the Holy Ghost until you had Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you had Jesus Christ as your Savior because he wanted to have mercy on us. And he showed his kindness and love towards us. And it had nothing to do with our works, only that our works were sending us to hell. And that's why he had to come and die for us. Then it says that being justified by His grace, so we have His mercy and His grace at work here, we should, be, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, now listen to what he's going to say, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So after he just said that the salvation that appeared unto them that changed their lives from what they used to be into what they are now because, the, because they trusted Jesus as their Savior, because of His mercy and His grace and the renewing of the Holy Ghost in their life, it wasn't of works. But you need to be careful to maintain good works. Well, God's working that in us. Why would he say that? Because it's profitable unto men. It is profitable for people to see our good works. It is profitable to see, for people to see what God is doing in us as his children. So faith without works is not biblical faith. That's where we come over to James, and that's what James says in James chapter 2. This is where also people who say you could lose your salvation or you work your way into heaven, this is where they come. They'll say you're justified by works. But this passage is talking about being justified before men, what men see. James is a very practical book written to Christians, not written to lost people trying to get saved. Matter of fact, most of the Bible wasn't even written to lost people trying to get saved because you can't get saved by works or whatever you're doing. It's written to believers. So we have in uh, James chapter 2, verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and not works? So this is, again, he's saying, this is mouth faith. These are word faith. 
This isn't heart faith. If a man say he has faith but no works, can faith save him? Yes, but not dead faith, but not false faith. Now that's what's being taken place here. If there is no works with it, it's not real faith. So no, false faith can't, but if you have real faith, you can be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. The scripture is not contradicting itself here. It, by, the Bible goes on in verse 17 and says this, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So if you really have faith, you don't have to walk around and talk about how much faith you have. Live it out. Live it out. Let the Lord work out what He has worked in you. And then people will know you have faith because you're living it. So He knows that true repentance will not only change His mind, but it's going to change His actions because He says, Then will I. Now how is David going to be changed here? He said this, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Now in the context here of Psalm 51, he's going to teach others about the Lord's forgiveness and what they are to do in their life. His ways, they're going to teach transgressors the Lord's ways, meaning what the Lord wants them to do, but also his ways on his part about forgiving. Because that's what's taking place here when, when it says then in verse 13, he's talking about once the Lord forgives him, cleans him up, gives him these things back, he's going to teach transgressors what God's done for him in his life. You know, he was probably going to go and he was going to read and study the Word of God, David was. He was going to get back in the Word of God. There's no doubt in my mind he was. Now, David didn't have the Word of God like we have the Word of God. He, he had Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And he might have even had Joshua and Judges and Ruth. I'm not sure. But he didn't have a Bible like we do. But he would get back in and he would study it. And he would know, this is what God says, he, that this is what I know about God. And you know what David did? He took the light that he had from the Bible, the Bible that he had at the time, and he obeyed it by faith. He obeyed it by faith. And then he was, I'm sure, going to pray to the Lord. He was, he was familiar with that. He was praying here in Psalm 51. He was going to start praying back to the Lord. Now, the best person to represent the Lord is someone who knows him intimately. Now, he says he's going to teach transgressors thy ways. So how is he going to teach the ways of the Lord if he doesn't know the ways of the Lord because he's not intimate with them anymore? Well, he's going to get back being intimate with them. And he's going to teach transgressors the way of the Lord. And we also need to get intimate with the Lord. We need to find out what his word says about him, what his word says about us. We need to find out how the Lord works. We need to pray and we need to spend time with him. And then we can be a better instructor to those who are transgressors. Then he was going to teach the ways of the Lord I believe not only to lost, but to backslidden. Because you've got to realize, David's in a backslidden state here. He is out of fellowship with God. He still, I, if he were to die before he repented in Psalm 51, I believe he's still going to heaven. Because <laughs> he was saved by faith through grace, just like we are. And uh, so he was still going to go to heaven, but he was not walking with God like he should have walked with God. And so he was going to be teaching lost people how to be converted, how to come to Christ. We'll find out that in a second. But also backsliders. And we should, we should teach by proclaiming salvation. We should teach by telling other people about Jesus Christ. Isn't that what the Lord commanded in Matthew 28? If we go to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, the Bible says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. David said, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways. I believe he's talking about teaching about Christ here in Matthew chapter 28. Teaching what Jesus did. Because a person has to receive Christ before they're baptized. It says they baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So what are you teaching them? You're not teaching them that baptism saves them, so get baptized. 
you're teaching them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and that they should trust Jesus as their Savior, just like Paul was preaching earlier and we talked about, and that they were supposed to put their faith in Jesus. And then when they put their faith in Jesus, they were supposed to be baptized. So I'm sure he was talking about he was going to proclaim to them the salvation of God. Now, he wouldn't have told them about Jesus. We understand that. David didn't know about Jesus specifically. He knew the Messiah. He knew there were promises. And he trusted God with what he knew by faith. But we, we should be teaching and proclaiming salvation. We should also teach by discipleship, meaning pouring ourselves into someone else, helping someone else to come along in the faith. The Bible says in verse 20 of Matthew 28, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. So he said he's going to teach them, then baptize them, then teach them. Well, he's going to teach them to be saved, then he's going to teach them because he's teaching them what to do. He's discipling them. What does the Lord desire for them to do? And we should also be teaching by example. This should couple our discipleship and our soul winning. Our actions speak louder than our words. I want you to go to 1 Timothy with me. Paul was telling Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 about living the right kind of life and being an example as a leader. And Timothy was a leader there um, in his life and pastored the church or churches um, in his life. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7. We begin here. It says, But refuse profane and vain or profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now, I read all that because the Bible says this, these things command and teach. So, Paul's telling him, there's some things you ought to be teaching. What was he teaching? He was basically discipling people. You should be teaching these things. Now, look at verse 12, because I told you it's not just teaching, but when you go and teach, there's a life that goes along with it. Verse 12 says this, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. In word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So he says when you go teach, don't just let it be of words, let it be of action. Let it be of action when you go teach. So the, Timothy was to teach in verse 11, and then to live it out in verse 12. And that's the, the perfect way to do it. Some people just want to teach without the life. And then some people want to live a life, but they don't want anything to do with talking to anybody else and teaching anybody. So there's two groups of people, and then there's a third one, and they say, no, I want to take the Word of God to somebody, whether it be in salvation or either they need to grow in the Lord and be grounded so they're not tossed to and fro with all every wind of doctrine that comes along from every TV preacher or any Christian that they hear, and they have all these different ideas. They want to be grounded. But I'm not just going to teach. I'm going to live it. And they're going to not only be taught it, but they're going to catch it because they see it. And all these ways here uh, bring warning to sinners of what a holy God expects of them. And the greater enjoyment we have in the ways of the Lord, the more faithfully and earnestly we will make them known to others. The reason why we don't make the Lord's ways known to others is because we're not enjoying them like we ought to be in our own life. So he was surrendered to teach transgressors. He said, when all this comes to a head, when all this takes place in my life, I, I want to teach transgressors thy ways. But he also says this at the end of the verse, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. So he was surrendered to win souls. It goes right along with him teaching. He surrendered to win souls. David anticipated, listen, not only that the Lord was going to change him, but that the Lord was going to change other people. He said, you're going to change me to be the teacher that I ought to be. 
that he was previous and that he's going to get back to. And he said, but I also anticipate with this change coming, with me being renewed on my inner man, with all these things taking place, that not only is my life changing, but somebody else's life is going to be changed because of this. So when the joy in verse 12 is restored, the conversion of sinners will take place. That's what he says in verse 12 of Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. I think I said this last time when we were looking at verse 12, but he did not say restore unto me my salvation. He said the joy of my salvation. He never lost his relationship with God, just the joy of it. And he said, when that comes back, then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. And when we have the joy of the Lord, we will want to tell others of what the Lord has done for us. And when they hear the word of God, they can exercise faith in what the word of God says and be converted. Always. No man has ever been saved without hearing the word of God. Got to hear it somehow. <laughs> Whether it was Adam hearing the voice of God directly, or someone reading a parchment, or someone having the parchment being preached to them in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, or you hearing it on the radio, however that is done, you have to hear the word of God. The word of God produces faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10... In verse 13. Let's go to Romans chapter 10 and verse 13. I want to read a few verses here because it is very important that we understand that the word of God must be heard. That's why we ought to be teaching. That's why he was saying he needed to teach it. And so sinners could be converted unto the Lord. So it could be an unbeliever being converted to salvation from hearing the word of God. Romans chapter 10 in verse 13, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? And the Bible says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is talking about context of someone being saved by hearing the gospel. But all those things have to happen before they can believe and call on the Lord to be saved. He said, I want to teach transgressors thy ways that sinners can be converted unto thee. But it could also be that a believer being converted back to the way of the Lord through sanctification. Why don't you look at Luke chapter 22 with me. Luke chapter 22, we, we look at the story here of Peter. I trust you're familiar with the story of Peter. I'm not going to take a great deal of time to look into it. But in Luke chapter 22, talking about a believer being converted back to where he needs to be with the Lord. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. He was talking to Simon Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, Jesus is speaking, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now, he was telling him of the temptation that was going to come for him to deny the Lord. And he said, your faith isn't going to completely fail, but you're going to be converted. There's going to be, you're going to fall away here. I mean, his, he didn't lose his salvation. I believe he was already saved because he had faith. The Lord said, your faith isn't going to fail. But when you're converted, meaning when you turn back to me, I want you to strengthen the brethren. And he did. And he preached on the day of Pentecost. All the people got saved. He was greatly used of God. He went to the Gentiles. He wrote First and Second Peter, which I believe is strengthening the brethren um, here, not only in his life, but in the Lord used him to write those books to strengthen the brethren. He was being converted back. And maybe that's where we find ourselves today. 
Maybe that's where we find ourselves with a lot of things different in our lives at this time. And we maybe comes to head some of the things that we need to take care of and repent of and tell the Lord that we have a need of Him in in our life. And we need to anticipate when we have biblical repentance that there's going to be a change to take place in our life, but then in other people's lives because the Lord's going to use us. And we need to be right with the Lord so that others can be right with the Lord. That's just that simple. The Lord can always use someone more if they're right with Him than if they're not, as is one of His children. Look, at that's why we have in Matthew chapter 5, we read this in verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, what's the end of our good works? God's glory. He gets glorified for it. He gets glorified. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Again, for the glory of God, our works in our spirit and in our body, the things that we are doing is for the glory of God. So when we glorify the Lord, we are making Him look good to others. He allows us to do that. He works in us as His children and produces these works in us that we might work them out by faith. We might live that out in His power in our life. And we bring Him glory. When we are walking in the joy of our salvation that He was anticipating in verse 12 that He's asking for, and consistency in the Lord's will, we'll anticipate two things. Again, don't forget them. We're going to anticipate two things. The Lord's going to change us, and the Lord's going to use us to change somebody else's life. Not that we do the changing, but somebody else's life is going to change because David said, now I'm going to open my mouth again. I'm going to start teaching people your ways again, Lord. And when I do that, I already know what's going to happen. They're going to believe it and they're going to do it. And their life's going to be changed. He already understood that in his life. So he became, after he became sorry for his sins and sick of himself, now he surrendered to serve. He said, once this change takes place, once you've done what I've asked you to do, Oh, I'm going to teach transgressors their, your ways, Lord. And, of course, they're going to learn their ways, too, in the process. And then we're going to see sinners converted. But this happens when we have the joy of the Lord, when He changes us. Are we surrendered to serve the Lord? Are we willing to teach transgressors the ways of the Lord? And are we willing to bring them to Jesus Christ? All we can do is bring them to Jesus. They have to believe on them for themselves. But are we willing to get them to that point and help them? Father, help us through your word tonight. Oh, I hope we are full of anticipation. Father, there's a lot of things done or needs to be done at this time in our hearts and lives, and I trust that each person in your church here is allowing you to work. Oh, it might be a hard time. It might be a difficult at time, a lot of things you're working on and a lot of uncomfortable things. But may you help us. May you bring us to the end of ourselves. May you help us to see the then when you work and you change us, what it's going to be like. I anticipate there'll be some changes in people's hearts in the services. I, I trust that there'll be a change of your presence as we meet together once again in the coming days. That there will be a, a sweet spirit. Not that there hasn't been, Lord, but it would be a sweeter spirit. There will be a more brotherly and sisterly spirit. There will be more anticipation of people being saved and your word going out. That you would break this apathy in our lives. You know what we need. I pray you would guide us at this moment for this invitation time. In Jesus' name we pray. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe, you're, maybe you say, Brother Justin, I'm not saved. I've never come to the Lord and, and had repentance toward God and placed my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In His finished work on the cross, in His death, burial, and resurrection, 
to pay for my sins. I've never done that before. But I need to. Well, I would tell you that you just need to place your faith in Jesus as your Savior. You need to believe that, but believe it in your heart. If you don't have a heart repentance, a heart faith, a heart confession that you need the Lord, you need the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you need His blood to wash away your sins. If there's not a true biblical faith like that, then you cannot truly be biblically saved. But if you do call on Him and confess that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus to save you, He will save you. He will wash away your sins. He will give you eternal life. He's not trying to hide His Son, Jesus Christ, from you and salvation. Call on Him now. Tell Him that you need Him. And He'll save you. Now, believer, you child of God tonight, what has the Lord spoke to your heart about? Are you really surrendered? Have you really come to that point in verse 1 to 12 that you can come to verse 13 and say, then will I do this when you do this? I remember when I surrendered to the Lord about two weeks after I got saved and I told the Lord a bunch of things. I said, you can have this and you can have this and you can have this in my life. I mean, this was, this was the time that I really surrendered once and for all to the Lord. Now, I had to surrender daily. But I remember that one time. And I told him, I said, Lord, by your grace, if you'll give me the grace, I'll never do these things again. I knew if he didn't change me, I wouldn't be changed. And that's what all my faith was resting in, is that his grace would be sufficient to help me. His grace would do for me what I couldn't do for myself. Are you surrendered? Surrender comes with a heart of anticipation of change. If all you want to do is give the Lord lip service, then there's never going to be a change. If you're not willing to have a broken heart towards sin, about sin, and come into a right standing with the Lord, if you're not willing to do that, then there's no surrender. Don't confuse yourself. Don't, don't trick yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Are you surrendered to take the Word of God and teach others? Well, I'm not saying you have to be a Sunday school teacher, or I'm not saying you have to go out and teach in a Bible college or or whatever, but you can tell people what you have been taught from the Bible, whether at, at church or whether in your own personal devotions you get something and you just take it to someone else and say, hey, you know, the Lord spoke to me today about this. Are you even trying to tell somebody else what, what the Lord's given you through His Word? Are you surrendered to try to help someone get converted? You know, no one's ever going to, you're never going to bring anybody to Christ and then receive Christ if you don't ask them, if you don't tell them what the Bible says. It'll never happen. There has to be a change in our hearts. These, this is for every believer. This wasn't just for King David. This is for every believer. We all must be teaching the Word of God to someone. We all must be winning people to Christ. We all must be bringing them to church and saying, now you need to follow the Lord and believers baptism. We all must be pouring our life into an individual or individuals and saying, now let me help you walk with God so you can do this on your own and mature as a believer. This is for all of God's children. Where are we at? What's the Lord going to have to do in our lives to get us to this point? This is a great time to get right with God and to have God burning strong in your heart what you ought to be doing for Him. Surrender to serve. David knew it was coming, and he, he was ready to get back to that point, but he needed God to change him. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. Father, please be thorough with each one of us tonight, whether it be one that might be listening, that's on their way to hell, Father, would they call out on you truly and trust you as their personal Savior? Lord, there's rejoicing in heaven over that. And I rejoice if that's the case tonight. 
in order for your children. We need to quit playing games. Lord, may, we, may you help us to get sick of ourselves, sick of who we are inside, sick of our sin nature. May we become sorry for our sins. May we be in great anticipation of a great change that needs to be taking place in our life. May you renew our vision of you and renew our vision of what you'd have for us to do in our lives. Individually, as families, as a church family. Your coming is drawing nigh. And we need to be serving you. So please help us tonight, Lord. Help us in all that we're trying to do, but help us not to do it in our own power, but help us to do it in the power of your Holy Spirit. Well, thank you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Until we meet again, I want you to take time to know the Lord and to make him known. God bless you.